So hello again, folks. We are back with Strategic Bombing Week here on World War II TV. I hope you watched last night's show with James Jeffries. It was really cool about Operation Oyster. That was um, a cracking show, a cracking presentation about uh, a lesser known raid of 1942. But the only show this week we are doing about the Axis bombing the Allies, all the others are about British and Americans bombing the Germans usually, is today's. And we are going to Australia with Dr. Tom Lewis, who is joining us there from Darwin. Good, good uh, evening. New morning for me, Tom. Uh, even for me, yep. So, um, you know, we, we, I think as Brits, Americans, Canadians, I think the Australian theatre of conflict is kind of overlooked generally. I'm sure you'd agree with that. Um, and it's interesting to look at this aspect of the Japanese taking the war to Australia. So before we kind of get into what the, the subject of the bombing of Darwin and, and the Northern Territories, how did you get involved in studying that aspect? Obviously, you are in Darwin, so where it all happened, but what was your route in? I grew up in Tassie, which is the little triangular island down the bottom of Australia, and uh, I was a, one of Tassie's few exports. We used to export apples to Europe, and then you guys joined the European uh, community and uh, stopped buying our apples, and uh, Tasmania went broke. Uh, but uh, I graduated as a young writer, teacher there. I was writing motorcycle articles. I love motorcycles and uh, went to Tassie, I'm oh, sorry, went to Queensland. I was teaching in Queensland and I was also doing dive master work as a scuba diver um, instructor. And um, I started researching shipwrecks and I became fascinated by it. Eventually in the Northern Territory, all these shipwrecks from the war and Cyclone Tracy, which uh, devastated the city. Uh, nobody knew what they were and that was my first book. That was 32 years ago. So I've sort of been here and I had an odd career from teaching. I went to the armed forces. I was an intelligence analyst for 20 years, served in the Middle East and other places. And uh, a lot of the time is sort of trying to orientate battlefields with what I then knew as a, as a soldier, if you were to call an intelligence analyst that. I was in uniform carrying a rifle, I suppose. I was actually a Navy officer. Um, and uh, the books sort of have just been coming because there's a lot of unknown history in Australia, military history, and uh, I like doing unknown things. You said, did you know there's a big submarine outside Darwin with 80 people inside it? And uh, it was sunk there. And most Australians don't know that. They know about the midget submarines in Sydney. Uh, I flew planes myself, light planes as well, and uh, having a military background, you sort of get your head around the military stuff. So that's where I am. I'm a military historian. I've done a bit of teaching lately. Um, I, I beaver away at books and uh, seem to be well received, I suppose. Occasionally I get attacked for something politically incorrect I've said, and here I am. Oh, uh, well, we all, get, we all get attacked for saying something, but I can't keep up to date with some of the terminology and things we're supposed to use and not use these days. But um, I, enjoy, I like your tack there about the uh, focusing on the, the lesser known story, because it's been a topic on World War II TV a lot in the last sort of, few months about how yeah. in many ways it's the same subjects that get written about again and again and again because there is this public demand for them. You know, Operation Chastise, Pearl Harbor, Arnhem. You know, and and the and the the equally important, equally vital, equally interesting stories seem to end up being written about by the niche writers that don't quite break into that mainstream. But that's what we're trying to do: is bring people on who can talk about these slightly less yeah. known things. So yeah. let's run through the basics of, of obviously Australia, part of the Commonwealth at the time, you, you, you're entering the war, but when did the hostilities in a sense begin for the Australian manla, mainland in World War II? Oh, pretty much, well, exactly the same as um, Britain did because we're part of the British Empire, in especially World War One. World War Two was no different. We were at war the same moment that Britain was at war. I think the first shots were fired in Melbourne about you know, across the bow of some German steamer trying to get out of a harbour. Um, and uh, then, of course, quick as a flash, nothing happened. <laughs> a bit like uh, leaflet raids over Germany, over France. Uh, go home, German. Um, nothing happened. And uh, we started exporting our, our airmen, our ships, um, our fledgling navy and our army to the European campaign. And uh, our chaps served in Tobruk. Uh, we had people in um, the RAF. Uh, we had RAAF components over there. We fought successfully in the Med with our, our Navy. Uh, one of our cruisers, HMS Sydney, led four um, British destroyers, or was it five, um, against um, the Bartolomeo Colani, um, an Italian cruiser, and they sunk her. 
Uh, so our chap was in command of the big ship and he had British under him, which was a big thing for the colonial people. Um, and so we're sort of doing quite well, but we're sort of a small population, only about six million in World War II, and we divested ourselves of our fighting forces to go over there and do to the Germans and the Italians what you should. I mean, I, I agree with that. It's sort of get on the front foot, yeah. engage the enemy before he's ready, otherwise he'll clobber you. Uh, so um, when the Japanese attacked, we were pretty aware that they were building up steam, and of course Pearl Harbor happened. Um, but we had very little in the way of forces here. One of the things I um, spoke about in a new book that just came out this year called Eagles Over Darwin was we were being defended by the Americans. Um, the United States Army Air Force was over here flying the air defence of the Northern Territory. So where were the Spitfires and Hurricanes? Uh, we didn't have any. <laughs> so yeah. we should have. Uh, was is, is my 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 shtick, I suppose, to use that expression. Um, but um, the Japanese came south and gave us a good flogging. Um, they we held our own. They tried with submarines first up in January '42, and we sunk one of them, still outside the harbour, as I mentioned before. I wrote a book on it, and um, then they sent four of the carriers south um, to do it properly the next month, February '42, and these were four of the carriers that attacked Pearl Harbour, same crews, same air crews. And they gave us a real pasting. And after that, it settled down to a slogging match um, yeah. for the next three years or so. So, so let's talk a little bit about, about the the expansion and the directions the Japanese are going yeah. in sort of 41, 42, because, you know, it, it's it's a lot of, they're going a lot of directions, a lot of ways, doing a lot. And yeah, as we kind of established, we, we talk a lot about Pearl Harbor and, and some of the things that Americans are involved in. But I think this end of the uh, the the, uh, the sector kind of gets a little bit less press, certainly in Europe, certainly in America. So, you know, obviously we're focusing on the events of February 42 and the, and the carrier strike on Darwin. But, you know, that, that map there that shows what's going on, that, you know, there's, it's it's a pretty swift expansion for an, a, 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 a rather large number of, um, of territories and places. And um, they did really well. They did really well. Um, and... Uh, the, the, big, the big strategic plan, it seems, um, from what we've been able to glean from their records, was to do that, to take that empire. And now they've taken that big circular empire with Pearl Harbour at its most uh, easterly extreme. Um, how do you hold it? And uh, they knew, of course, that the, 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 that the Americans are going to come for them. Uh, and the British Commonwealth uh, forces are going to come for them. So how do you hold the empire? So their plan was to use New Guinea as a base and cut off the Americans coming to Australia. Because if you're going to fight from San Diego in World War II, you're not going to win. You're just not. The Pacific is so big. What, 71% yeah. of the planet is water? Um, and uh, whenever I'm teaching it, I do a bit of teaching still, and use, kids always use a globe. And say, look, look how big the, the world is on a Makata map. It doesn't look nearly as big. Um, you say, they've got to come right around here. And in those days, you've got no nuclear-powered aircraft carriers that can stay on station forever. You've got to refuel. And where are you going to refuel from now that Pearl Harbor gets pounded, if that was yeah. sort of the scenario? Well, there's a very so, interesting point you made about the globe there, because when I had Ian W. Toll on, on, on my Iwo Jima week, and he's on again on Friday talking about the B-29s bombing Japan, is when you look at a globe, half the places that people know of in the Pacific, you can't even see them on the globe. You know, the mm. islands of Iwo Jima, Okinawa, Guadalcanal, they're, you know, they're, they're pinpricks on a globe, a conventional kind of desk globe. But the ocean, as you say, is just enormous. I mean, that huge, mm. huge distances to cross um, mm. for both the Japanese and, of course, for the Allies later on. But let's talk, I think, I want you to talk about the significance of Darwin because, you know, you, we spoke about it before we went live because... Again, for the Brits and Europeans watching this, you know, who's perhaps Australian geography isn't as good as their ETO at geography. It's 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 a huge harbour, isn't it? So run with a little about the history of how Darwin developed as a as a key kind of naval it's, port, really. It's um, Kitchener was actually out here. We we're very proud of that in uh, before World War One, and he was uh, complete with moustache, and he was saying you need to establish a base up there in Darwin. Uh, which is sort of an outpost at the time, rather than on Thursday Island, which is in between New Guinea and Australia. He said, you've got to get over to the west because that's, that's the communication channel, that's where they'll come. And so we started uh, getting 9.2-inch guns um, uh, here, and the emplacements are still there, 27-kilometre throw, to repel the Japanese, almost repel anybody, actually. The Russians, even the United States, were thought of as a threat. Uh, and we backed them up with 6-inch guns. So you've got this big, huge harbour, three times the size of Sydney. We had a boom net across it, the longest one in the world. 
Uh, we've got uh, runways, oil tanks, uh, CBD as a city infrastructure. Having said that, Darwin is a horrible place to be in World War II. It's, it's tremendously hot. It's a ferocious climate. For about six months of the year, it's almost unbearable unless you, until you get used to it. Uh, and then it settles down for four months of glorious summer weather like um, England on a summer's day. Uh, but for at least six months of the year, it's absolutely atrocious and it buckets with rain, two, nearly two metres of rain a year. And we've got crocodiles, we've got horrible spiders, we've got, I've got snakes in my backyard here and I, I'm pretty wary of going out after dark because my duty is to put the, the compost bin in. I got bitten by a snake about two years ago in my own front yard and we've got lakes near here with crocodiles in them. Um, so it's, a, it's a, a horrible place for Western soldiers and aviators and naval people to come to. Uh, but they were posted here, and um, we had a reasonable sort of infrastructure. But I think I said before, the um, air defence was being flown by the USAF. Uh, we had nothing here from our own RAAF uh, and uh, in the way of fighter support. We beat off this submarine attack, and then the Japanese came for us. We had 16 anti-aircraft gun sites in a circle. Um, there's a couple of big islands to the north of... Uh, Darwin called the Tiwis and they flew down there from the four carriers and they did a big circle to attack Darwin from the southeast because it's the last direction you'll expect the enemy to come from and the attack was enormous it was 188 aircraft uh, 36 of which were zero fighters and the rest were made up of the Kate which is a three-man single-engine bomber high-level bomber uh, and uh, then followed up by the Vals which are a two-man um, dive bomber each of them carrying one bomb and uh, they really worked us over. The Zeros shot down everything that they could, and nine out of the ten Kitty Hawks, four of the pilots dying. And then um, they plastered us well and proper, and we had a go. We shot down four of them, which is pretty hopeless, really. But we hit 30, according to the carrier deck logs I got hold of, uh, with gunfire, but not enough to bring them down. And then, to make matters worse, two hours later, they sent in a strike of 54 uh, twin-engine bombers, Bettys and Nels. Uh, with even, even without a fighter escort, they knew that they shot down everything and they plastered the airfields. And by this time, I think everybody's thinking that the amphibious assault will be next or the paratroopers, which they had used in Java and uh, what's now Indonesia and so on. So there's a degree of panic and people, some people ran away. A lot of these people in the RAAF, for example, weren't trained to be soldiers. All they were trained was to be a rigger or a fitter. Mm. Uh, so the degree of confusion and panic, it wasn't... But, then, but, but what, was, yeah. what was the purpose of the Japanese raid? I mean, it wasn't to stage an invasion of Australian mainland, was it? I mean, or was it? I, I'm no, saying... No, no it, it, um, it was to keep us honest. Uh, so um, it was basically to keep our heads down and to, to not have this port annoying you in your with your right flank as you turn right to take New Guinea. Yeah. I mean, you can see on that map there, that it's, it, it's, its location is strategic, it's important. Everything you're doing over here, there's this, this, this itch you can't scratch of a, of a potential force to your, you know, to your right or your south that is there. So, you know, so Darwin is a, is a, is a threat. How much um, focus did the Japanese put on planning this? I mean, you know, because we, we talk about Pearl Harbor and how, you know, that went to the very highest levels in the Japanese government and everybody was involved in this. Is this, is this raid given the same amount of, um, of, of preparation the Japanese or is it, yes. run yes. through it for me. They, they did a good job. They actually had a 17 ship um, battle fleet assembled with four carriers. Uh, three of the submarines left over from the previous month, which must have been rather gloomy for them. Um, battleships and cruisers uh, in attendance, um, destroyer fleet and so on, assembled 350 k's off Darwin and uh, took about an hour to get um, to, to within strike range um, and uh, planned it beautifully. Um, Fushida, their commander, said later it was a sledgehammer to crack an egg. Um, but they did a beautiful job. And uh, then they started coming back the weeks after that, sometimes Betty bomber fleets of 60 at a time with zero escorts. And we're picking ourselves up and trying to get ourselves back on our feet. And uh, to give you an example, we had one radar set that was op was supposed to be operational on the 19th of February 1942 for the first raid. It wasn't. They were still making it go. And so our fused network defence, as you use if you're in a modern Intello, uh, of radar and radio and searchlights for night and, uh, air and fighter aircraft up high just didn't exist. It was all in bits. 
And it took us some months to get all this back together. And then we started making a fist of defending ourselves and shooting down a few more than they thought they could afford, mm. maybe. And then we started putting in bombers. And so we're trying to turn it around. Um, but that first year, 1942, was a very bad year for Australia. It was sort of almost the year we went out. We were losing ship after ship all around the world in the Navy, some of them dreadful losses, uh, 645 men in one ship to a German raider, actually, the previous year, HMS Sydney. Uh, and um, it looked like the year Australia was going to be defeated. Mm. And I want you to tell me, I'm glad you mentioned it, and I think I'd like to, el to elaborate on the, if you like, the Australian air defence system, because you know, when we talk about the Battle of Britain, we, you know, and for years and years, the credit was all given to the few, the fighters, but actually what won the Battle of Britain for us was the, the coordinated system of radar, uh, Royal Observer Corps, anti-aircraft guns, working as a, as a pretty um, um, solid and well-organized air defense system. And you're saying basically Australia didn't have that. And even if it had had the technology, given the size of your country, how many radar stations would you have needed around the coast to protect yourself? I mean, it's, it would have been insane, wouldn't it? So, yes, so you, you don't really have anything. You just kind of have ran... Well, explain what you have. Well, you sort of orientate to the threat, don't you? You have your picket ship or whatever as your radar repeater. But we had land radar, and uh, where do you put it? In the end, we did have radar across the north of Australia, but it took a lot of catching up to do. And, of course, as your, your viewers would know, if you know where the radar is, well, you don't attack there. <laughs> go around it, short yeah. range radar. So go over there and surprise them by attacking from that direction. That's what I'd do the moment I knew what radar was looking for me. So we, we, did have, um, we did have standing patrols, uh, caps and so on, up high eventually. But it took a long time to fuse it all together. And, of course, we're working with the Americans um, the Australia, the British really, and uh, Brit Britain gets a bit of a caning for this. They sort of, oh, they abandon us. And I point out when people say that, I say, look, Britain's fighting for its life. Have you ever heard of the Battle of the Atlantic? These people are getting killed. Uh, they're absolutely getting murdered. Uh, plus, of course, the Blitz. A lot of Australians don't know about these things. And uh, I point out that Britain was on its knees almost and doing a terrific job in defending itself and trying to keep things going around the world. Uh, so, yeah, we were very isolated. Uh, we lost a lot of troops in Singapore without firing a shot. And uh, lo and behold, the Americans are here. And we have a thing now we call the Alliance. Uh, and um, after World War II, we had B-52s staging out of here. We still do. There's an enormous exercise here on air exercise on at the moment. Uh, with F-35s and things like that. But that was the beginning of the alliance back then. And America's been our great and powerful friend ever since. We still love Britain. Um, but, uh, yeah. The, the Americans well, it's going to become a republic, but let's not go down that rabbit hole. But, yeah, I mean, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the fact that this this idea of, of this part of the war, late 41, 42, the British, we haven't had any victories yet. We're some time away from El Alamein. We're some time away from you know, from any of the other major videos. We've, we've, we've held our own. Dunkirk has been a victory out of a yes. defeat. The Battle of Britain has been a victory out of a defeat, but they're not victories per se. They're still, we're still very much a defense. And the Battle of the Atlantic is incredibly important. Um, and we, at that point of the war, we are still effectively losing it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's all hands on a pump at that point of the war very much. So anyway, let's bring it back to, to Darwin. So let's talk, you know, you said about these, these aircraft coming in from the southeast, 19th of, uh, of uh, uh, February, 42. So um, they're, they're, they're just trying to get everything in the harbour, the Japanese, is it ships and the installations? Do we know what their actual plan was? Uh, well, there were 56 ships in the harbour. Uh, um, Peter Ingham and I put out a book called Carrier Attack, which is about that thing, and sort of the forensic guide to the attack. And uh, it's a huge harbour. They sank 11. Uh, they killed 236 people. Uh, and they destroyed 30 aircraft. Um, so they did a really good job on the day. And um, as I said, they, they just kept coming back after that. Um, their plan was pretty well achieved. Uh, the, the computer charge. And the, these are some photos that, you know, you sent me the, the PowerPoint. The, these these were some Japanese propaganda photo. That was their own publicity about the raid. Um, so yeah, from there, they, they, they think it was successful, yes? I mean, they, they, they made the press and they talked about it. Back yeah, that's supposedly from the second raid. That's inside of Betty. So there's a chap looking thoughtful there. There's another photograph, which I don't think is there, but there's another one eating a can of baked beans or something. 
and they were looking very noble and thoughtful. And of course, they'd had it all planned beforehand. They knew exactly where they were going. It's easy nav. Um, the uh, second raid came from air um, stations. So the first raid was from carriers. Uh, second raid was from air stations. The carriers never came back. It was the only raid they ever used carrier-based aircraft. Uh, in fact, we never saw Val's and uh, um, uh, Kate's ever again. It was all Betty's and Oscar's and Zero's and Tony's and things like that. Uh, so in, in flown, strangely enough, by the Navy. Um, I often point out to people that Japan didn't have an air force in World War II. These were all Navy aircraft off land bases. We only have had one, one Army air raid against Northern Australia. And so this is Japanese in World War II. They do a lot of things strangely. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, indeed. And, you know, and, and the fact is, you know, as you said, that this is... This is kind of a maximum effort, but we said before going live, and although they did these other raids, they should have perhaps done a more decisive raid immediately afterwards. Because what was the loss of, uh, you know, what was the loss of shipping in the harbour? Because it wasn't, it was the, the raid nine, was accurate. Yeah, nine ships in the harbour, um, two ships outside, freighters in the main. They only sank one warship. That's HMO Stella Rain, which sunk the submarine the previous year, uh, and that's a ship called the um, Neptuna blowing up behind it with that atomic bomb-looking explosion. Um, she actually had 200 um, depth charges which blew up in that explosion there. Uh, so wow. some silly person had put her alongside one of the main wharves um, and uh, killed 45 people at that explosion. Um, so it was on for young and old for about uh, 15 minutes. But um, after the war, a lot of myths and legends, um, and uh, that's, a, that's a second rate, I think. Um, but... Um, it um, was obscured in mystery for quite a while because Darwin's so isolated. It's not as if this happened in Plymouth and uh, a few chaps came and photographed it the next day. Darwin is uh, 4,000 kilometres away uh, from some of the other capitals. Even today, it's a four-hour flight from here to Sydney in a modern jet. Uh, in those days, it took about a week to get to Darwin because um, by air, you were hopping refueling and so on. There was no train service. It was only half the way. Uh, that's a crash Betty. Um, but uh, very, very isolated in those days. And so when the smoke had cleared, it was a bit of a question of what the hell went on where, there. And the news started filtering out. Uh, and you've had quite a few myths and legends over the years. The government tried to cover it up, to which I say, well, why would they? They wanted to alarm the population of Australia. We're under attack, boys. Um, what actually happened in Australian World War II was a bit curious in that you found people going off and fighting in the med in, in a warship, and eventually that warship would be sent home to refit and it would be replaced by another destroyer or something. And the destroyer would come back to Melbourne or Sydney or Brisbane or some place like that, and they'd sort of, hang on, don't you blokes know there's a war on? Because there was no blackout. Uh, everybody was churning along at uh, full commercial rates and, uh, and, and some of the chaps were overseas fighting, and people were going... Don't you know you can get bombed here? Oh, can we? Who's going to do it? The Japanese doing the, what they did to us was a huge wake-up call. Even though uh, HMS Sydney was sunk off Western Australia in November 1941, the word still hadn't really got into Australian heads that the war's going to hit you where it's going to hurt you. You can get attacked in, in Sydney. And we did with midget submarines and uh, even big submarines which shelled places like Newcastle, one of our commercial ports further up the coast. That's the second raid going in in Darwin, um, taken from the boom net, uh, those uh, floats from the boom net that went across the harbour. Uh, and why do you think there was a overconfidence perhaps in Australia at that time? Why, why you know, because this is now after Pearl Harbour, but every, the world has seen how harbours can get, you know, uh, sudden attacks coming out of nowhere that are devastating. So is it why was there a, a lack of um understanding that this could have happened there especially somewhere like darwin which you know is a big port and facing all this japanese expansion is it just overconfidence or people not thinking about yeah. it or wanting to think about it we're a strange mob as they say out here mob being a term that's used quite a bit uh there's an expression she'll be right mate uh it's a big savage land where you can get attacked by nasty things and uh, we get uh, people die from shark attacks. Somebody died tragically yesterday. Um, it's a tough place. Uh, and Australians have developed a very phlegmatic, sardonic attitude. Most of them wouldn't know what those two words mean, I expect, but 
<laughs> mm. <laughs> be right, mate. Just have another beer. And uh, look, just just check that up, will you? And we should be right. We'll just fix that and give me the bailing wire. They're very self-sufficient. If your car breaks out in Australia out in the outback, you sort of get the bonnet open and you start fixing it. And just hold that. Just hold my beer, will you? And, and so yeah. Whereas Australian Americans, when I noticed when I was serving with them in the Middle East, had an expression "stay in your lane." Which meant shut up and wait until the, the mechanic arrives, uh, and the Brits would brew tea. Uh, that's sort of you know Australia. Yeah, we are verging in cliche territory now, but <laughs> all these cliches have a basis in fact. That's they why do. they they keep on going. Is yes, yeah, so it, yeah. you know it is interesting, but um, yeah. so you know your 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 ex- so your there's a lot of there's a lot of things to unpack here. So so the Aus- Australian people are generally a little bit disregarding of a potential attack coming in. You're ra- you don't really have much of a radar capability yet. You've sent a lot of your ships and young uh, uh, Royal Australian Air Force guys are overseas there in the Med or elsewhere in the world. Um, and so these these attacks hacking happen in Darwin. You know, four carriers. This is this is enormous. This is the, this is a this is a, a major scale raid. Um, mm. And you're saying that it, it maybe led to some kind of this idea of conspiracies and, and, and myths and legends afterwards. I mean, what what was the official line on this? I mean, did did anyone speak up and say, we must do better with our air defense? We need to put more yeah. money in it. Surely this is going to resonate with someone, a politician yeah. or, or commander yeah, it, somewhere. It did, but it's a huge country. It's absolutely immense. Um, we go to Britain and uh, we think nothing. I remember driving from Brighton to Edinburgh once in a day and, we thought that was normal. And my cousins in Britain were sort of horrified. What did the car service? And we just do enormous kilometres over here because we have to. Um, so it, it sort of, uh, the air prime minister was very angry and um, it sort of was a wake up call and it was widely publicised in the newspapers, of which there were many in the radio stations at the time. We didn't have TV then. Uh, and uh, so the word went out. But to give you an idea, one of the midget submarines that was sunk in the uh, Sydney attack in May 31st of May 1942, um, we sunk two out of the three. The third fled and was only found about 10 years ago. They raised two. There have been depth charges and the crews were dead. uh, And they got the two-man crews out and they were buried. Some controversy over that. And then they got the two wrecked wrecked submarines and they were sort of pretty smashed up, cut them in half and made one out of two and put it on a truck. And then they sent it round Australia to a lot of the regional towns and villages down south to raise money for government bonds. So you sort of loan money to the government and to wake people up and to say, we got attacked in one of our biggest cities and this killed people. We lost 21 people in that attack. Um, Not many, it wasn't that successful, but uh, pretty sad for those 21. And wake up Australia, get your act together and start fighting. because we are down here at the bottom of the world, and a lot of people think we're pretty safe. And the New Zealanders are even worse. They sort of mm. rely on air defence force to do things. Uh, but um, we, there's a rude expression, um, you're down there at the arse end of the earth, um, uh, down below Asia, and you all sort of speak English and uh, look out, we'll come for you sooner or later. What, are, what Australians are scared of is um, Asia, to a fair extent. Um, and, but we are a very wealthy country. We have tremendous mineral wealth. And uh, so we are a bit antsy about that. And World War II was not that much different. It's just there is that phlegmatic, bloody, lazy attitude sometimes Australians have got. She'll be right, mate. We'll just fix mm. it when it comes. Hand me my rifle, do you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you're saying this because if I was saying that about you, you'd be I'd be accused of you know being yeah. being racially insulting. But yeah, it's, I, I don't <laughs> mind taking the piss out of myself. But I don't like other people doing it about me. But I love your you know the arse end of the world. There's a fra- expression in French, the tout du coup du monde, which is the whole of the arse of the world, which is is a nice one. If people say where do you live, you say, I live in the tout du coup du monde. I live in the arse end because you live down some country lane in the middle of nowhere with no internet connection. Um, right. Even today, so you know. So, but anyway, going back to the raid again. So, nineteen, you know, all out four carriers, wave after wave, valves, cakes, the whole lot there. Um, but now, with your book and the, the museums and things, are start showing more interest in this now. So, I wanted to go on down the side, the, the path of the of the of the museum where they've got the wreck of this particular aircraft there, because I think that's an interesting story. So, whose aircraft is this we're talking about? Well, that's Toyoshima's. I'm actually working on a documentary at the moment with a film company about him. Uh, so hopefully more soon we'll reach the wider world. But that was the first Zero ever captured by the Allies. Uh, and he was 
part of the escort group uh, in the attack on the 19th of February. We'd actually tangled with zeros before that. Um, there'd been a few zeros around, and uh, there'd been a, a combat action between a Kitty Hawk P40, uh, what's often called a Tomahawk, um, and uh, that had resulted in a four-engine Japanese flying boat being shot down north of the Tiwi Island, north of Darwin, on the 15th of February. We had the submarine action the previous month. Um, but um, then this big raid happens, and we had 16 anti-aircraft gun sites, about 10,000 troops in Darwin. Everybody's carrying a rifle, everybody's having a go uh, while taking cover as well. And um, the Vals and Cates did their, their work in quick order. I think the raid probably only lasted about 15 minutes because you've only got one bomb to drop. And uh, then you obviously depart for a second breakfast um, and uh, as fast as possible. You notice that the, the bombing raid from the, the southeast too means one bomb run over the target, which is a great idea. Uh, so the zeros go with them. But everybody's having a bit of a go with Lewis guns, 50 cals, 303s, the 3.7s, uh, some two-pounders, all sorts of things. Uh, so there's a lot of lead in the air. And one of the 303 rounds, we know, um, hit Toyoshima's engine. And uh, he's exiting the, the, the battle space. And he's going out with the, the, the bombers and the rest of his mates. And he's losing oil pressure by the look of it. And he made a decision to ditch on the Tiwi Islands, not in the sea, but he crash land on the Tiwi Islands, which to the north of Darwin, about 70 kilometres north of Darwin. Uh, the right-hand one is Melville Island, named after a Brit. Um, the left-hand one is Bathurst. And he crash landed in the bush there and banged his head on the dashboard, by all accounts. And then he was got out of the wreckage, uh, wandering around. He found a local Aboriginal tribe group out hunting for yams, and he picked up apparently a baby. There were some women there. He picked up a baby and the women went away screaming. And the next thing, a couple of the local boys come out after him uh, and held him up. Um, one of them rather bravely with a tomahawk, which he sh sh shoved into his back while removing his um, little Nambu service pistol at the same time. Wow. And um, Toyoshima was sent uh, to Darwin and then to Kara, which was an enormous POW um, camp in New South Wales. It had a breakout, which he was part of the leader of uh, in 1944. Over 1,100 Japanese tried to get out one night. It's the biggest POW breakout in history. It wasn't very successful because Kara was a long way from the sea and where are you going to go? Um, but uh, this was sort of in the future. Um, he'd flown at Pearl Harbour. Um, so it was an interesting clash of cultures that um, he'd be held up by this bloke. Uh, and uh, he's flying state-of-the-art fighter that's never been captured. The Allies, that, that is us, were very keen to get our hands on it for intelligence purposes, and the wreck was duly recovered quite quickly. Uh, and um, it was uh, poured over, it was analysed, uh, and that's where it's ended up, um, in an aviation museum, which is about 10 kilometres from where I'm sitting now. Wow. Um, so the, uh, and there can't be many zeros brought down by 303 in World War II. I can't, I'm, I'm imagining that's yeah. not going to be a very large tally. Uh, no, he's just unlucky, really. Um, I've sort of had trouble communicating this to the, the film people I'm working with at the moment. They're sort of saying, well, he must have been hit and then came down. I said, no, no, he came down 70 kilometres away, therefore he took a hit. He probably lost oil pressure. He probably got hit in the oil feed system somewhere. And they look at you and say, well, what's an oil feed system? And, uh, and so mm. but there was a 303 round in the engine, which was recovered later. So it was either a rifle or a Lewis gun, I expect. Uh, most of the aircraft are flying, uh, firing 50 cows, the Kitty Hawks. Uh, and there were quite a few 50 cows on the ground, and it wasn't shrapnel damage. Um, and you can see what's left of the aircraft, not much. Um, the tail is somewhere else, I think. Um, got a separate shot of that. But we had um, bucket loads of aircraft shot down. In the Empire Strike South, I think I've got 62, uh, 62 Japanese aircraft shot down across northern Australia. A lot of them never found. They're in the water or in the bush, and it's a huge country here. And believe me, if you've got something to, nothing to do on a Saturday afternoon, you do not go out looking for Japanese aircraft because you can cover hundreds of kilometres for no, no result. Um, it's very hot and horrible and expensive. Um, so uh, this one was recovered. It ended up in the Aviation Museum uh, collector's shed after the war, and uh, they've got a B-52 in the same, uh, same hangar. It's enormous, um, uh, just a state-of-the-art bomber alongside this Zero. They've got bits of Betty's, for example, that were shot down. 
uh, Dyna aircraft, uh, high-speed twin-engine recon aircraft. Uh, we shot a few of them down too. Um, most of them still, however, lie scattered around northern Australia. Some of them have never been found. Um, one of the reasons I like being here is that um, you can find new things that have never been found before. As, as I said before, one of yeah. my themes, the other one is sort of trying to overturn myths. I like doing that. So so going back to the, the, you know, the raids on Darwin, so they, they're all effort, four carriers, multiple flights, Val's Cape, the whole lot, escorted by zeros, only one military ship um, in the harbour is actually destroyed and the others are, are, you know, are non-military, but that you, you we said before you went live they probably should have done something immediately the next day carry on carried on kind of maximum effort and i know we, we don't want to go down into the counterfactual side of things particularly but what was there a chance of darwin being eliminated they brought back enough people could they have actually knocked out the harbor as well or was it all about the ship is there anything could they have done um, damage to the the facilities or, or was that it was always about shipping uh well we had these big circular oil tanks and they didn't actually manage to bust one in the entire war. Uh, we've also got these huge runways. It's one of the longest runways in the world, and space shuttle standby runway, and that was being established. Um, and the RAF base was basically sort of up and going within a few days and patch things up and off we go. Um, I reckon you'd probably almost take an amphibious assault to, to see the place, to cease operations, and for everybody to run away. Uh, there was that sort of idea they could have a lodgement. They would lodge here. And there was, there was this dubious concept called the brisbane line we'd withdraw to brisbane and we'd mm. fight it from there upwards and so the japanese would have come to us across this vast desert and they couldn't but the psychological effect of them holding darwin and saying what are you going to do now i think that would have been tremendous um but um for some reason their strategy was uh take new guinea and stop the americans coming which i think is a good one the Battle of the Coral Sea, which was fought obviously off in the Coral Sea with uh, the Americans to the fore and Australia assisting, uh, was a draw, if you like, but it stopped the Japanese taking Port Moresby. And mm -hmm. uh, they were going to take Port Moresby. And if you don't take that, then how are you going to run ops out of New Guinea? Well, we'll take the, the top bit, as they tried to do for the next couple of years. Um, but um, who knows what's in their head? The, yeah. Beyond, I mean, to be honest, why did the Japanese attack a warship with their submarines the previous month? I would not attack a corvette that's specifically equipped to kill submarines. I would lie low like Brer Rabbit and wait and attack tankers and things like that, like the Kriegsmarine did. Attacking warships is something weird the Japanese did in World War II. I wouldn't do it. I'm going to attack a warship. It'd kill me. That's what he's designed to do. <laughs> and, so, and, and why they did that seems to be something very strange that's rooted in Japanese psychology. And so well, that's, an, that's an interesting line of discussion because I think a lot of people, we judge the, the, um, the abilities of the Japanese Navy by the, 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 the glowing success of Pearl Harbor. I know Pearl uh, Midway and Coral Sea go a bit differently, but you know, what you're saying is, is actually that their tactics were a little bit mixed up. They weren't prioritizing the right things. They were doing things in an odd way. And, and, and if they had put a little bit more effort into into um, attacking the right targets in the right way, they would achieve more. I mean, I know they've got a lot going on in 1942. It's a very, very busy year for the Japanese, mm -hmm. um, as you're saying, with the naval battles with Americans. But yeah, it's interesting that you're, you're, you're viewing them in maybe as not as good as they could have been. I just, uh, I just, um, I was trying to come up with a word the other day for this, and the, the word I came up with was crazy brave. Um, yeah. They did things like the Yamato, the last stand of the Yamato. Uh, they used um, submarines to attack warships. They they die in Banzai charges. They invented the suicide diver. I mean, this is a bloke who, uh, in my book, Atomic Salvation, I've got a chapter on suicide naval craft. He's a bloke with a, dive, with a breathing set on, and he's standing on the bottom of the sea waiting for D-Day, and he's going to ram this pole with an explosive on it against the bottom of the Higgins landing boat. And so you must be joking. <laughs> it's a really yeah. stupid idea. And I got suicide speedboats uh, as well as suicide submarines. So why did you spend time and money doing this? It's not going to work. But to a Japanese, it is going to work. The concept of one life, one ship, it's a really good idea. And my life is not my own. It's my emperor's. Yeah. Um, so there's just so much to ignore that. These guys wiped themselves out to the tune of 97% in World War II. I mean, 
in the standard logic that I've looked at in books about tactical battlefield behaviour, I've one published called Lethality in Combat, was that 30% of a force breaks and runs. When two of your mates are on the ground alongside you, um, wounded or dead, you collapse and you run, you flee, you throw down your weapons. Not the Japanese in World War II, they just keep fighting harder. So it's a very strange world. Um, mind you, I think in terms of sheer capacity, sheer ability, the Germans were probably better. Um, I know I'd, I'd rather be up against in World War II. I'd rather be up against the Japanese army than the German army because the German army knew what they were doing really well and they fought tremendously well in retreat. The Japanese expended lives, I think, foolishly. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And, you know, we, we did a show on the Italian Navy uh, last week, which was kind of quite um, quite exciting, really, because they have a, a bad rap. And actually, the, the point uh, my guests were making is actually that they were they were the big threat in the Med, particularly in 41, 42, not so much the Kriegsmarine. But this is why I like getting into these interesting conversations about the what ifs and the different. Mm -hmm. But let's get back to the, the, the continuation of the Japanese attacks on, on Australia, because I think that's what we're here to talk about, because you said, mm -hmm. you know, it was 60 odd crashes that you identified. So that's just the ones crashing within your, Australia. So over the next, uh, let's go, let's, we'll run through the rest of the war. The Japanese repeatedly attacked Australia. Again, what were the purposes of attacking it when you get towards later in the war? Because before you went live, you were saying they were still up until mid-1944 attacking uh, the, the Australia. What what were the points by then? Now, now any idea of expanding the empire is all completely gone now. So is it just because they can, because it's just a nuisance? Um, what, what no, no, a bit of that. It, it's good strategically. It sort of keeps us annoyed and keeps us on the back foot, which you always want to do, don't you? I used to teach the principles of war when I was a naval officer. And uh, you, you always sort of offensive action is what you want. Yeah. So yeah. if the other guy, if you can make him on the back foot all the time, he can't attack you. So that's a good idea. But what we wanted to do and what we eventually managed to do was we managed to hold the line against their, their fighters and bombers. So we started to push them back and intercept the bombers out at sea before they bomb the target. And they're taking unacceptable losses. And so then they're starting to defend more than they're attacking. And then what happened here was at the end of World War II, we had 51 airstrips in the Northern Territory. Northern Territory is huge. It's the size of Britain, France and Germany all put together. But if you imagine this huge rectangular, tall sort of place, which we are, um, it uh, was full of airstrips and uh, most of them being run by the Americans who built them in quantity with the CBs and their engineering people and so on. But strangely, we also had RAF fighter squadrons here. Uh, we had a Dutch uh, bombing squadron. We had R and RAAF bombers. And uh, so then we're starting to do to them what they were doing to us. We, we're running bombing raids deep into their territory, which is now Indonesia, Malaysia, whatever. And our bombers are escorted by fighters. And they're doing hopefully for them they're doing what we were used to do defend except we're not very good at it they're, they're starting to retreat and they're starting to bring in their forces because the desperate defense of the home islands is going to be important um and uh, so we're penetrating further and further north and in the end the, the war leaves the territory be behind northern australia's out of the war uh the last attack here the last um aircraft shot down here was over western australia in august 44. Uh, and um, after that, it's sort of they're not coming anymore. We didn't know that, so we're still holding the line. But now we're starting to be out of range, and so the thing that's going to carry the war forward, as everybody knows, is the island hopping campaign. Yeah. With twin, twin big strikes across the Pacific, uh, and MacArthur and so on, who was based in Australia, actually came through Darwin in his big retreat, a batch rack, he was just south of Darwin. Um, and um, then, of course, he's doing big surf and going round, I shall return. Uh, and then, of course, um, as we were discussing before the show started, all these little pinprick islands. And, of course, the aircraft carriers. Uh, the Americans had, uh, I think it was about 26 aircraft carriers running, groups uh, running towards uh, mid-45. And mm. the Brits are starting to come out with their carriers as well. Uh, so there are over 30 carrier battle groups massing for the invasion of Japan. And it's all taking place well to our north. So the funny thing was that there's all these isolated pockets of Japan that sometimes have been left behind or you choose to go around them or hop over them. So, for example, Rabaul, where I was uh, with a cruise liner group about four years ago, sort of abandoned uh, by the Allies, but there were Japanese still isolated pockets of them there still fighting on. 
I've got Bruce Cam uh, Gamble coming on talking about Rabaul in, um, I think it's in July, mm -hmm. talking about for the fortress there. So that's an interesting topic I'll be going into. But I want to move on uh, as we kind of get towards the end of the show to talk about, you know, you're, 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 you're a widely written author, but obviously you've read a lot as well. Do you think when you, without naming names, when you're looking at the works of the American, British and Canadian, other sort of nationality authors writing about the Pacific campaign in general, that what was happening in Northern Australia is overlooked by those historians? Do you think it's more of an Australian known story, but should be known better out, uh, outside of it? Yeah, look, I'm ashamed to say really that we, we don't, know our, don't know our own story. Um, the history books we were using in the 1950s, 60s, 70s were all British, and I learnt British kings and queens, and it's great history. I really enjoyed it. But I knew nothing of what happened in Northern Australia until I got here. And then I, when I got here, there were all these shipwrecks in the harbour and people didn't know what they were. But, oh, that's a World War II ship. Well, can you tell me the name of it because I'm diving on it tomorrow? No. And I actually ended up writing a newspaper column for the local paper, which got turned into a book. Uh, and they sort of, why don't Australians know about their own history? because they weren't taught it. It wasn't a conspiracy theory. It was just mm. that the, 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 the history books were being used. You didn't throw them in the bin because that was all they had. And uh, slowly the history books have been rewritten. But to be honest, um, the war was huge, as you know, better than I do, I think. And so much of it is European and very, very important. We still study it and teach it to our kids in schools today. We do teach um, Australian military history about mm. World War I too. But... Um, it, it does pale into insignificance beside huge things like the Russian front um, or the atomic attacks or uh, what happened um, under Hitler or why did World War I start? And you only get a certain amount of time in the curriculums. So, yeah, we should learn more of our history. It's a common theme we get here. Um, in the north, I'm very much aware of it. But I'll tell you now that there are plenty of places in Tasmania and Victoria that have hardly even heard that Dharma was bombed in World War II, let alone all Northern Australia was in flames in World wow. War II. So, I mean, Scott oh. Grimwood, who's a regular viewer, he's asking, just to, if we haven't actually explained it in, in one go, so how many Japanese attacks were made against Australia during the war, roughly? Or do you know the uh, exact number? There were, there were 208 um, air missions, and I'll use that. It's a sort of a, a quick grab figure. It's a bit confusing, really. But I, I counted an air mission as being one Japanese enemy aircraft. But at the same time, there was their enemy air missions. One of them on the 19th of February had 188 in it. So quite often an enemy air mission could be a massive bombing raid. Um, there's other weird ones. For example, there were six zero fighters and nine zero fighters sent against Broome, which is the north of Western Australia. Um, and they actually only attacked with machine guns and cannons, no bombs. And they killed 86 people. It's the second biggest air raid in um, Australian history, yet almost no Australians know about it. Because Broome is incredibly isolated. It's at the top of Western Australia, a beautiful place, but it's difficult to get to. Um, so we wrote a book about it called Zero Hour in Broome years ago, and my publisher has not reprinted it. Very angry about that. <laughs> but it, well, Michael Nelson is is there. He's in Broome. He's watching right now, and he, oh, you know, he yeah. asked about that. So you have you have at least one person who's aware of that. Um, yes. And you know the, well, your point about yes, that the 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 military world knows about these big battles, and we teach some things at the expense of others. But we all know that when you look at World War Two, the margins between victory and defeat are often very narrow in all these battles. Look at El Alamein, look at Tobruk, look at Stalingrad, all those battles, and the, and the, and the sea battles, Coral Sea, Leyte Gulf, Midway. Even if just half a percent of Japanese military resources was dedicated to attacking Australia in World War II, that half a percent, and it probably was more than that, could have been used somewhere else. They're, the thought they were putting there could have been used somewhere. And I think this is why you need to consider these things in the context of everything else. Every... Every theatre the Japanese are involved, every campaign, every country they're involved in combating is weakening them militarily. Same with the Germans, isn't it? Is that, yes, we talk about Normandy, but we talk we don't talk about the German divisions in Yugoslavia or the German divisions in Norway and these other less areas. It's all part of these Axis powers weakening their position by spreading themselves too thin. So for that reason alone, I think Australia is worth this, th 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 worth talking about. It's part of the war effort. It's part and, of the... And, and we, would have, we would have been invaded if the Japanese had been more successful because the, pol the policy of isolating Australia, so it's not supported by the Americans, the biggest ship we could build in World War II was a destroyer. 
Uh, we didn't have our own aircraft carrier fleet or submarines. Uh, we did in World War One, oddly. Um, but um, we were not that self-sufficient. We could make small arms, we could make tanks, uh, we could make pretty terrible aircraft. Um, but uh, we weren't even building Spitfires and Hurricanes here, let alone mm. good long range bombers like B-29. Um, so if we had been isolated, and the Japanese did discuss this, we know from their records, uh, they would have taken us. So if they pushed America back enough, if, if America had lost heart and said, rightio, well, I guess we're not going to win too, much, too, too well here, boys. Bad luck, Australia. We would have fought to the end. We're, we're pretty tough people. We wouldn't have given in. And I think we would have fought on as guerrillas. And they, they actually did that in their strategic analysis. The Japanese thought well, that's what we would do. Um, but they would have taken us, and, and rightly so, because we are very wealthy in terms of mineral wealth. Uh, we have enormous mines here. And even in World War II, we had sheep, corn, uh, bauxite, you name it, we had it. And uh, the Japanese knew that. They're going after a material empire. So take Australia and enslave the, the population. So we 1942 was a very difficult, bad year for us, a very dark year. It was um, a phrase I use, I think is a, not a very good one, the year we nearly went out. Mm. Well, I, I certainly can. I'm mean, speaking for myself, and I think I'm speaking with some of the audience here. That that's something we wouldn't be aware about is how how perilous Australia's situation was in 1942. And you know, and 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 thank you for for sharing that information with us. That's what we're trying to do here. We had a question come in there. Um, uh, who, where was it there? Um, from the Great Dominion, who's pretty much watches all my shows. Um, did you talk about the MV Kulama incident? Yes, in the, in the book Zero Hour in Broome, which um, is, is, people can get it in libraries and um, in uh, second-hand uh, outlets online. Yeah, we did cover the Kalama. Uh, and, and some of the myths and legends of the Broome raid, there was a famous um, uh, group of diamonds carried by a, a gentleman called Smirnoff that disappeared into the waves and then sort of came back. Um, so there's some strange stories. That was the longest um, over-water navigation feat by single engine aircraft at the time those japanese aircraft took off from what's now timor in indonesia they had a guide navigation aircraft called a babs with them and it navigated all the way to, to Broome. and then they set about the flying boats that were in the harbor which sadly were being um geared up to take off that morning and they were full of refugees in the main women and children so oh, if you wow. go to Broome now which is a great tourist destination very beautiful um you can still see from world war ii when the tide goes out there were enormous tides there um, there's parts of the flying boats that were hit by the Japanese are still there in a little museum. It's very sad. Uh, but this is the second biggest air raid in Australia's history. But you'd be fairly safe in saying that only about one in 20, one in 30 Australians would have heard on the attack on, on Broome. Darwin's a lot more visible these days because we have a national day of recognition for it. And it does mm. get on TV and so on. But the Broome raid, only less than a month later, um, disappeared into history as have a lot of the uh, thousands of people who died up here in World War II. Yes, and is that because, because like every uh, every country that ended up on the winning side, we like to talk about the victories. Te we tend to. So, you know, Adam Lunny, who I, you know, who I know you, you know, we've had on World War II TV, you know, he talks about the Spitfire operations, you know, in, in the ETO and getting involved in Normandy and shooting down Germans, being part of the liberation of Europe. That's a, in a sense, a more positive story and something you can kind of, get to grips with more so than your own country being bombed because your own air defense and it wasn't working perfectly it's a yeah. we, we do like to talk about that that success side of things which is which is uh, to, to i think I mean, we should we should improve on we should we should look yeah. at our defeats as well or our, our, yeah. our not defeats but you know the bad they times can, they compete for attention with lots of other military history um to give you an example world war ii is covered in a 10-week unit um, in year 10 in Australia. Um, and uh, that means it's about four hours a week for a year 10 student for 10 weeks. So 40 hours all up is World War II. So in that 40 hours, you've got to cover why did World War II start? How did it start? Where did it start? You've got to do the Adolf Hitler thing. You've got to talk about the Holocaust. Yeah. Um, you've got to talk about... Uh, the causes of it and for that you have to go back to world war one of course and they they would have done world war one the previous year in year nine so you hopefully that you're building on that do you remember world war one kids you did it last year no you don't <laughs> <It's> <laughs> a sequel yeah yeah and there's so much in world war two to cover 
And, of course, any teacher who knows about it will chuck in some local stuff, particularly if you live here, instead of um, within walking range at um, the school where I'm doing some teaching at the moment. There's a, it's a base camp uh, used by the Americans. We just go for a walk in the bush, kids, and there's not much there. There's wreckage and signs and things like that. But we've got a great aviation museum and a lovely military museum here. Um, you, you organise an excursion if you can, which costs money and time. Uh, but you've got so much. World War II is such a big topic. And, of course, it, when you do it, and I, I think you over in Europe would be quite justified in having a go at us if we didn't, what if we never covered what happened to the Russians? Um, what if we never covered what happened in the Blitz? What if we never covered what happened to France? And all that curious complexity of, hang on, um, why were the Italians involved then? And then sort of, they change, did they change sides, sir? And <laughs> there's so much well, to say, Whatever you cover in terms of studying World War II, you're, you're having to leave something else out. You, you can't cover it all. I mean, I'm learning that on my channel. If I do a, a theme yeah. week, I'm still only scratching the surface of what I could cover in that week. So I'll do another week in the future. And, you know, I, I could live to be 150 years old. And I won't get anywhere near to covering this, the ideas and things people come up and say, why don't you do a show about that? You should do a show about yeah. that. And I go, yeah, there's brilliant ideas. And, but and teachers that are our worst enemies, you sort of realise you've got to try and cover it in three different ways to get it to stick in their heads. And then, of course, you've got some kids will miss out on it entirely for an entire unit for a week because they're away with the school netball competition. And mm. so I'm going to do it then. And you never covered the Victoria Cross. You teachers are useless. <laughs> so, and of course, then if you've got competing sort of demands for other people don't see World War II as being that that interesting or that that useful for what kids should know. I disagree, obviously. But yeah. history is such a broad topic. There's so much to know that yeah. Well, I mean, it's a good point to mention. I mean, th thankfully, you are writing these books. You're getting these these stories out there. And I'm hoping some of my European and American and Canadian or, uh, viewers will be will re will reach out and get some of these books and look at, at studying another another area of the war that perhaps they'd overlooked a little bit. I know certainly I, I could definitely do with a lot more brushing up of my knowledge of, of Australia's role in terms of Australia itself. I think people know about Tobruk. They know about some mm. of the stuff overseas more. But I think actually that the Australian mainland is 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 very much overlooked. So what what are you working on right now? Well, you say you work on this documentary, but I, what's your next project in terms of a book? Um, I'm doing something on bombers out of Northern Australia in World War II. So that'll be everybody's bombers: the Dutch, the Americans, the Brits, um, the, the the Australians, and so on. Uh, I said to one one of my publishers, I'd do something on Cyclone Tracy, which just about leveled the city in 1974. Sort of the military angle because they were the large mm. uh, saviors of the place. And I've just had a book out in um, Britain called um, Medieval Military Combat. So I was sort of looking at uh, well, looking at the War of the Roses and the actuality of how you'd fight on the front line in medieval combat. Um, you can see there's a bassinet behind me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, I noticed that earlier. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so sort of, that's a different field for me, and uh, I'm sort of trying to suggest that they would have fought in a regimented way rather like the Romans and the Greeks, with a complete lack of evidence, historically. <laughs> so, right, okay. Britain, I don't like me at all now. <laughs> but, because uh, yeah, I think I'm wrong. That was fair enough. Well, I mean, uh, it's been an, an interesting show. I've, I've learned a lot today, and I think it's just opening up another avenue of, of study for some of the people watching this, and I'm sure people watch it on Catch Up later on when we get in a better time of day for us in Europe. But... Right now, I'm just going to remind people what we've got coming up, and I'll come back and say goodbye to you in a second. So, um, folks, don't forget, we've got another show tonight, so 7 p.m. UK time. Uh, Luke Truxell's coming on to talk about the bombing of Romania, so not just Ploesti, but the strategy behind why the Allies are bombing Romania, but busts and myths about the, the, some of the things written about the raids on Romania, so that would be really good. Then tomorrow, again, Tony Redding is coming back. Remember, he did our Chindit show back in February. He's coming on to about the bombing of Germany in 1945 and particularly the destruction of the German city of Forsheim. And then on Friday, Ian W. Toll, we're back to the Pacific again as he will talk about the B-29s bombing Japan and we'll talk about Guam and Curtis LeMay and some other controversial figures there. So that'd be quite cool. Ian's always good value. But right now, it remains me to say thank you to to Dr. Tom Lewis for giving us a bit of an introduction to the bombing of Australia. And as usual, folks, there are descriptions below uh, to Tom's website and, um, and the book that we're particularly talking about, where there are other books, but his, his website is below and you can buy his books in all good bookstores. And 
I forgot to say we've just had our first naval VC awarded in Australia, Teddy Shea. Okay. We've only got one naval VC ever, and that was last 1st of December for a, an action in 1942. So the Army and the Air Force had the, the 100 before that. We had to fight for 78 years to get one for the Navy, but it was very, very controversial and radical over here. Thanks, Queen Elizabeth, because she gave her assent, and we were in doubt about that. So thank oh, you. Oh, okay. We just, I just, we, we got a question coming in from um, um, from Lance, who's a film director. Oh, sorry, hang on, where it is? Um, he might have missed it. Um, where does Tom stand on the downing of the zero by Gus uh, Winkle, or does he go with the 2010 theory? Oh. I, I'm, well, I'm not sure what that question yeah, means. So perhaps you yeah, can give so it a context. He had to go with a with a handheld machine gun at the zeros coming into Broome. Uh, I think he had to go and good on him. Uh, as to who shot what down, it's really impossible to say, isn't it? Uh, you have a go, but unless you can do some sort of forensic analysis, we have a one. We have one bloke in Darwin who claims he shot down Toyoshima's zero. He's died now. He was a naval bloke at East Point, and he said, oh, "I had him in my sights, and I took a shot, and it was my shot." Well, who knows? Unless you can find his rifle, which you can't, and do a ballistic yeah. match. <laughs> well, they're still debating about von Richthofen, aren't they? How many years? Not hundred and two yeah, years, on, or whatever it is. Good on Gus for being brave. Well done. Absolutely. Man. Yeah, that's it. it. Doesn't matter who, as long as someone did. So, well, there you are. Thanks. Th thanks very much, Tom, for joining us. And uh, I'll have you back on, and we'll do something else in the future. But right now, folks, I'm going to go and have a have my breakfast. In fact, I haven't had it yet. And I will see you all this evening for the show about Romania. So thanks for watching. And don't forget, check us out on Twitter and Patreon and check the links below. Thanks, everybody. Cheers. Goodbye.